intended to give you um, a short, uh, short presentation here um, with IRPC. I'm going to talk about behavior of paid on cruel under CIS. And I'm very quickly um, explain to you why interaction between cruel oil and CIS is worth, um, is worth studying. What are the relevant aspects of CIS for oil transport? And finally, I just show you how does crew oil behave within the CIS, what is the timing of the oil liberation, and where we can expect to find oil. And I would like to thank um, all my colleagues on uh, funding agency who have been um, making my work uh, possible. Um, with the decrease of uh, the CIS cover in the Arctic, it opened the whole potential of the resources of the Arctic, especially we are talking about maritime, maritime shipping route throughout the open sea, uh, water season on the uh, north coast of Russia, on potentially in the future decade on the northwest passage, but also it opened um, the access to oil and gas uh, resources in the Arctic, which are, according to the USGS, count for approximately 20% of the uh, world um, resources to discover. And if we look uh, especially in the case of, uh, of Alaska, if we look here as well, we can see there is more than 10 billion barrels left to be discovered. And currently, most of the operations are centered on the area just on the part of the Trans Alaska pipeline around Dead Horse. And within what has the, the marine exploitation of oil on the Alaskan North Shore, it's mainly from four different uh, artificial islands uh, going from the east to the, to the west. And currently, there is another project to build new island called Liberty Island, six miles offshore within uh, 20 feet um, of water. And when the oil is extracted on those islands, um, four of them, Ogobuk, Nigatuk, North Star, and Liberty Island, will a pipeline to export the oil from the island toward a data force when it's feeding the Trans-Alaska pipeline system. With the risk of exploiting oil on from Artificial Island on the subsea pipeline, we need to have a strategy to oil on ice. Really combat the Arctic oil spill scenario, uh, if we can write it just on the Arctic Ocean, the presence of the absence of water, uh, if in case of open water, we can use the usual method for uh, oil spill. If we are with partially ice cover, and if we are in, within a broken ice, it seems that in situ burn and mechanical recovering have been showing quite a success. And finally, there is a big unknown, the three scenario, is what happened in full ice cover if there is an oil spill under the ice. So there is a manual just explaining what we will attempt to do. But since nothing has been happening so far, we have not really any idea if it's going to work. And where will the oil come in a full ice cover? So one of the ideas it could be just uh, the oil is just escape from the rupture of a vessel oil, or is just uh, an oil well leak, a pipeline leak, or a natural leak, just release some oil which just uh, accumulated below the ice. And once the oil is underneath the ice, there is a very well-known diagram uh, published in the AMAP trying to display every case scenario where we can imagine the oil on ice interaction. So it always comes when the ice comes from the... You always need to think about the drift with the current of the spreading of the oil underneath the ice. The oil moving up through cracks, through fissures, accumulating with open lead or broken ice, uh, getting trapped when the ice begin to rage and to raft, or especially what I'm really looking at is kind of the simple of the case is we have an oil under ice oil speed without current on the oil after accumulating the ice bottom is encapsulated within the ice as the ice grow and later in spring with the ice warming up the oil mob up in the ice porosity on the community of the surface and pool in the, in the spring. And relatively to the past and current research, what have been retargeting have been either seas part in the lead on broken ice on seas area. 
All right, you see that the idea is the oil quickly invade the skeletal layer after the oil spill. Um, we need at least 10% of forestry within the ice for the oil will be allowed to move upward. That's kind of the current state of the art on what we are saying was going to happen. Um, I'm just going to review a little bit uh, the sea ice cover on what are the different the stratigraphy of the ice. Most of you know that sea ice is from the Arctic Ocean frozen seawater. Um, if we did take a call in the middle of the season, we are going to a, um, a snow cover, which is accumulated snowfall on the surface of the ice. Then we got the first layer of granular, granular sea ice, which is very uh, small, grain size, oriented in every direction without any preferential orientation. Um, we are kind of expecting this granular layer in the next decade to grow slightly thicker than it used to be just because with more open water in spring we may have way more turbulence on the, on the upper layer before the granular layer consolidate on the with transition to columnar ice cores. And within sea ice, it's very important to, to remember that there is some large scale uh, uh, features, for, for features, and so on. Like this one, which is called a uh, brine channel, and it's a policy which extends from the ice bottom almost towards the transition or towards the, the granular layer. And those, those four are on the millimeter uh, diameter scale. But, uh, but we also need to think about when the ice is forming, there is a very small layer of brine in between the ice crystal, which as the ice is getting cold, end up to be a very small pocket of brine which is trapped. And we can see here, so there is just singular uh, brine, brine pocket, pore space within the ice, which are not connected. And there is a very low porosity within the ice, less than 3.5%. But as the ice warm up with, uh, towards the spring, the, the brine um, with the temperature increase, the brine melts the surrounding ice, and we end up with increasing porosity. And with the increasing porosity, we also have an increasing uh, connectivity from the bottom to the top of the ice. Uh, with the increasing, por uh, with the increasing co uh, connectivity, we also have the permeability of the sea ice uh, begin to be uh, to increase, and at some point, typically when we are five percent of porosity, uh, it has been shown that the brine is able to move within the ice to go from, to uh, convect within sea ice. Uh, what does that mean? All this porosity in case of a noise spill under growing ice. So here you can see in the background uh, in blue, it's the temperature of field. Um, Typically, um, typical of uh, the sea ice cover from the beginning of the ice growth to the end of the growth season. And if we have uh, oil releases at the beginning the of the season under some ice, if we very quickly invade the bottom, the bottom layer may invade some vertical channel. But then for most of the winter part, as the ice remains cold and the forest is very low, there is not really any possibility for the oil to move up. And this only as when we arrive in spring during the melt season when the ice is warming or the porosity increase or the, the pore space get way more connected that the oil begin to move, to move from the oil lands towards the ice surface. And later in spring when the pore space is very open, very connected, the pore space can end up to be saturated with crude oil and the oil is going to pull at the surface. Or here it's kind of, we know that's going to happen, but it's very difficult uh, to sample Dutch conditions. So we do not, it's more of thinking what is going to happen later on the, in spring that we have read, uh, we have already been researching that uh, until the ice is completely rotten. Uh, and if we try to think about remote sensing for oil spill under growing ice on how we can, where we can think, of, where we can detect the oil, um, we need to think about the oil location, if it's at the bottom of the ice, within the ice, or at the top of the ice. We need to think about the ice thickness, which is above the islands or below the islands, and also to the oil, ice properties. Very early at the oil spill, a couple of days after the oil spill, underwater acoustic sensor allows us just to 
to know what if there is oil and how much oil there is. But then they kind of end up to be competitive line. And then GPR and radar tend to perform well during the, the winter to detect the presence of oil. But with the increase of porosity, uh, it tends to be much more challenging to know where is the oil, the oil is with GPR radar. And then later in spring, optical could be a very good way just to see where is physically present of oil on surface. Um, for the past couple of years, I've been doing a lot of several different oil and ice experiments, and most of them have been the same idea with a tank or a of artificial seawater. We grow ice to a certain thickness and then inject oil at the bottom, and then just see what happens when we are on with ice. Um, we are always kind of following the physical property of the ice, like salinity or temperature, who let us make a uh, compute later. Uh, different properties such as porosity and permeability. And we look where is the oil either on the surface cutting slab to look on the vertical extent of the oil or the oil and thickness by acoustic, uh, by acoustic measurements. And so I've been referring later to uh, three different experiments. The UF experiment, which is a small scale experiment, and two large scale experiments, one that happened in Trail on the other with Bosidero in Embro. Trail and Mosidero have been very large scale experiments. Um, with the Trail experiment, we had uh, an amazing subset of the experiment we have been giving us. Think we can be uh, able to look at the timing of the oil migration. So, what you look at the colorful uh, pi uh, picture here, we've been taking regular scientific curve, uh, where there is a small triangle, interpolate the scientific field. And with the temperature field, we've been uh, computing what is the porosity field throughout the experiment from the oil release here on day two until the end of the experiment or the start of the melting happening on day eight. Um, it's very interesting to see on the bottom, looking at the oil and thickness, we're able to measure the amount of oil we have within the sea ice over the time, which is C squared here. On the red dot are the number of spots we've been able to contact the surface on when they've been appearing. So here you have a picture of the surface after seven days after the oil release, and you can see here that was some oil surfacing at the surface. And very quickly after the, the oil release, we see some oil moving the skeletal layer, but as the ice remains cold and the porosity in the ice is low, not really anything happened when the oil is trapped. So we still have the apparition of a couple of oil in, at the surface. So that would mean there is some movement of eye, even in cold ice, which was never think about it before. But really we need until the most of the ice cover, the policy of the ice cover increase to have a large amount of oil moving within, um, within the sea ice. Uh, until the end of the experiment where almost all the oil have been moving, cutting going through the ice and pulling at the surface. And if we look at the amount of oil we've been moving the ice and the amount of porosity, we can compute the, uh, satur the oil saturation of the pore space, which is the oil volume or the brine volume. And we can see that we are effectively ending up to about 15% or so of, um, of saturation which is more or less what I've been thinking since the beginning of space, the pore space of the, at saturation, the pore space of the, of the sea ice will contain 15% of oil, approximately. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple of pictures from the growth season. Just after the oil is released, it can, which can be spread under, under, the, the, under, the water, under the water, and that is natural condition. Whereas in all experimental setup, we always have very nice cavities where we put the oil in. Um, then when the oil is growing, the oil lands are entrapped. Like it could be a larger lands or way smaller oil lands. And later on, during the growth season, we are talking of potential upward migration. Um, that could happen if we had a connected pore space between the ice bottom towards the ice surface. If the pore space itself should be large enough to allow the oil to go upward. And finally, as the oil move 
for the oil to move within the pore space, some brands need to be displaced and move out of the pore space. And in one of the experiments, we have been the, we have the, here is the ice bottom with the oil at the bottom. And during the winter, we can see in some of the brine channel, we have been seeing oil coming up towards the surface. And here you can see the surface size different spot of oil on the surface. Um, finally, for the main season, as um, the main season size so oil mobilization have been taking you as soon as the ice is getting warm, the oil gets more mobile because there is more porosity, more connected porosity. And here it's another experiment with uh, the Mosidio project, where we had on one side some columnar ice, on the other side we had some granular ice and some columnar ice under this. And we can see from the uh, March 30th to April 2nd, there is the warming happened on the last day of the experiment, and we can see that there is oil moving up in every, so every section, the red curve uh, shows the uh, oil volume fraction by five centimeters section. And we can see that in columnar ice, there is some oil moving throughout the whole uh, extent of the ice, whereas if we have a layer of grass at the top, there is less uh, oil moving upward. So that's kind of the data or the porosity. And if we look at the picture itself, vertical extent of the ice on the second, that's how you can see here there is one layer of columnar ice with bright channel filled with oil coming up towards the surface. Whereas in gradual ice, we have the bright channel of the columnar subpart filled with oil, but as soon as it arrives towards the granular ice, it seems to spread horizontally and try to find a path to surface. And that's kind of, it seems like for me that the granular ice like, acts like, um, like a cork on a bottle just um, impedes the oil to move easily upward. And looking more on the detail, the microstructure of columnar versus granular ice, I've been doing some, uh, looking at the pore space uh, using X-ray micro uh, tomography. And we just take a, a piece of ice and you just um, use a CT scanner, like a, image, a medical image, 3D imagery, and you look only on the pore space. And in the columnar ice, you can see this vertical the vertical brine channel on the largely vertically connected pore space, which could be like highways for the oil to move upward. But if you look on the granular ice, you see a much more intricate microstructure with a wide range of pore space. And is more likely on the present of the very small pore space may be a uh, constricting point where the oil cannot move past that point. And then the path for the oil to move over 30 meters could be much longer and much more tortuous, hindering um, the movement of the oil within, uh, within the ice. So that's kind of, I'm hoping, um, that's kind of the idea how the oil move up. And as a conclusion, I will kind of, um, like that you take home the message that the oil size interaction, during the growth season, the oil is mainly encapsulated, say some potential for some vertical oil migration, but it will be very small amount of oil. And during the melt is where the oil will get mobilized on the rate mostly of water. And also that is very important to think at the CIs, at the 3D media, with a strong stratigraphy. And the importance of the ice texture, granular versus columnar ice is quite important. And all the work I've been doing so far is going to try to be fit, to try to build the oil migration model. Uh, and what is left to do is quantifying what are the constraints factor typically in the granular ice. And the goal is to support oil speed preparedness and response, but also um, by improving our understanding of how the oil move within the, within the pore space, we are more likely to be able to also understand all the action processes of the biochemical actions that happen between underlying ocean up to the atmosphere. And in terms of fluid sensing, looking on the oil and ice interaction, so far, most of the experiments have been very ideal cars without snow cover, often with very thin granular layer of ice. And really, the melt season is likely to be the very challenging part to try to know where is the oil and also to 
be able to estimate when is going to the oil being able to uh, reach the surface. Um, for you your attention, and I'm more than happy to uh, to take any question you may have. Thank you, Mark. That's really great to have your research presented. I think that oil and ice is not something we typically look at, at um, in our in our team. So I want to open it up for a couple of questions. If anyone has any questions, please feel free. Chime in. All right. Well, I mean, we can take questions again at the end. Um, I think we we'll might have some extra time. If there are no pressing questions right now, I'd like to move on with the agenda. Um, Randy Church Key, the Executive Director for the Arctic Domain Awareness Center is here and I'm really pleased that he's able to give us a couple of presentations on the Arctic oil spill monitoring in the high resolution ice ocean modeling and assimilation system project. Um, Church, you may take as much time as you like. We're running ahead of schedule, so please feel free. Well, good morning, thank you. Uh, I did not, I was told earlier about uh, 10 minutes for uh, presentation for five minutes for each project and five minutes of Q&A. So if I have more time, then I'll, I'll happily offer perhaps a bit more detail on the individual projects as well as of course the center. Let me first say thank you for the gift of your time this morning. Um, I look forward to just give you a brief overview of what uh, the Arctic Main Awareness Center and then uh, specifically about these two projects and some preview of coming attractions if I have the time. So first of all, uh, for those who may not be familiar, the Arctic Main Awareness Center is a center of maritime research uh, that is hosted by the University of Alaska, uh, specifically uh, at the University of Alaska Anchorage, but we do have a very strong and close collaboration and share, if you will, the execution of this walk agreement between the Department of Homeland Security and the university uh, with our dear colleagues at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. So it's kind of a one team University of Alaska approach. I myself am down at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Our center was uh, founded and in, in, uh, established essentially in July of 2014. Uh, we were, had received our first funding in January 2015. Uh, by November 2015, there was a transition in leadership and we established the current leadership team uh, in January 2016. We're in year five of a five-year cooperative agreement with the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Office University programs. We've just been notified uh, that we're going to be extended at least another two years of funded research uh, by the Office of University Programs and Science Technology and DHS. And our principal customer is that is of the United States Coast Guard, specifically the U.S. Coast Guard and their Arctic mission set. We're one of currently nine active centers. There's normally 10 centers, and there'll be 10 centers established very soon. But uh, right now, one of nine active centers in the university uh, program enterprise. Uh, we're the only one that has both a geographical and functional alignment, that is geographically oriented to the Arctic, and then functionally aligned to the United States Coast Guard. Uh, our other fellows out of the centers uh, involve other aspects of the Department of Homeland Security mostly in the law enforcement and uh, part of the enterprise and things such as customs board protections, immigration and custom enforcement. We, on the other hand, are oriented to the, essentially the enterprise of the U.S. Coast Guard in their search and rescue, disaster response, humanitarian assistance mission set. And we're also increasingly involved in security and al analytics uh, for the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, as a center of excellence focused uh, in the maritime domains of the, of the Arctic region, most of our work is oriented towards a number of projects in, in fundamental and applied research as a, that advances decision making for the Coast Guard in their Arctic operations and help them assess and mitigate risk in conducting both search and rescue altogether, all search and rescue, humanitarian assistance, disaster response, and law enforcement mission sets. We work closely with Canada. In fact, uh, we are, advise ourselves of being a, a very can-U.S. focus aspects and, and very much uh, have some strong collaboration, not only across the universities uh, and industry members with that are focused in the Arctic uh, domain in the United States, 
but equally so with Canada. Uh, as a center, uh, we actually uh, are run a network uh, that involves a number of research institutions, and that includes uh, currently uh, the University of Alaska Anchorage, Fairbanks, University of Washington, specifically Applied Physics Laboratory, Texas A&M University, University of Texas El Paso, uh, University of Maryland, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and we're literally underway of establishing uh, new uh, relationships with uh, four, as associated four additional research projects. I'll describe that more in a moment. Uh, but for us, uh, in our mission sets, uh, we of course have done a number of uh, research areas that advance uh, knowledge products and science technology in the Arctic region. But we're also now investigating uh, yet four new additional projects uh, that were just been notified from a couple of weeks ago uh, that are intended to help advance uh, oil spill research in the Arctic region. For those who may not be familiar, uh, our project, our center, of course, in the disaster response area does specifically address oil spill research and then of course trying to characterize a sea ice environment. Uh, in this case here, we uh, this in October 2017, uh, one of the methods of ways to acquire, if you will better understand and characterize new research needed in the Arctic is through, as relevant to the Arctic operator, is through our Arctic Instance of National Significance Workshop approach methodology. Uh, last fall, we hosted in concerts with the uh, Coastal, Res uh, Coastal Response uh, Center at University of New Hampshire, specifically Dr. Nancy Kinner, uh, worked with us to pull together a Arctic Incident and National Significance Workshop focused on addressing Arctic oil spill uh, in the maritime region of the Beaufort. And uh, in this context, so we've uh, just uh, gone through an enormous amount of work to characterize uh, the current shortfalls and needs in addressing a uh, well offshore oil spill. In this case here, we take a fictitious scenario and then we characterize uh, what's needed and bring together select groups of people to help really thoughtfully think through uh, the problem sets, mission gaps, and the needs for research. And that's of course founded by a company at the beginning from comprehensive literature reviews. Uh, and this goes associated with this essentially the workshop help us get the RFP right. From there we go out and then uh, solicit uh, folks to give their best and brightest ideas. In this case here, one workshop, uh, we get one RFP, those are roughly about $1.1 million worth of funded research. And then that uh, brought into uh, 22 uh, funded responses, uh, proposals, sorry, responses to the, to, to the funding opportunity. And uh, right now we're in the process of uh, trying to establish the first four of the research uh, projects. And then uh, we probably have at least one or two more to come uh, in the next few days to weeks from US Coast Guard. And the intentions are for us to get as much research focused in this area and this uh, in oil spill response and support of uh, of Coast Guard identified mission needs than it was through the Arctic Islands process. So this is just one methodology for us and one, one approach. We, of course, in addition to science, technology, research, and development, the center is involved in creation of knowledge products. And these knowledge products are intended to help uh, the U.S. Coast Guard and identify mission need. Uh, just literally prior to uh, last week was consumed, for example, in addressing a workshop called the North American Arctic Maritime Environmental Security Workshop, where we brought together um, 80 some folks, approximately 80 folks uh, across Canada and the United States as a Canadian US planned and conducted workshop and conducted here at the University of Alaska Anchorage that involved practitioners, researchers, academics, industry members that have taken a comprehensive look through various lens in Arctic uh, maritime security to include environmental security and bringing stovepipes together to try to get cross-leveling and greater understanding. From this, we create a knowledge product that's useful across uh, the federal enterprise, both the United States and Canada, state level, province level, and also locally. And including in this, of course, for us, is specific outreach to indigenous communities, particularly in the state of Alaska and the high north in Canada. And the last week was one great example of that where we had a number of our presenters were actually experts and leaders from local governance in Arctic Alaska, 
and also, of course, uh, represent tribal leadership both in the state of Alaska and then including uh, the high north in Canada. Um, so with that as a starting point, uh, our center, of course, is getting ready to host an uh, annual meeting at headquarters U.S. Coast Guard. We do this every, every fall time frame. For those folks that are in the D.C. area, you're more than welcome to join us where we'll be doing a specific uh, rundown in each of our research projects uh, and also, of course, include research in the, in the transition pathways uh, as we continue to try to squeeze every amount of goodness of every research dollar spent. And strategically, we prize ourselves and trying to be create extremely low overhead to apply every research dollar uh, to add content of advancing research. We're a, a three and a half million dollar a year center, uh, as, as similar to all the other centers. And we are at this point running along at about uh, nine cents of every dollar goes to overhead. So 91 cents of every dollar goes to directly to advancing research, uh, specifically the Arctic operator. Uh, I was asked to, in the brief time, to give a quick rundown of uh, articles for modeling and high resolution uh, ice ocean modeling and assimilation system, HIOMAS. These are two legacy projects for the center uh, and one of a number of legacy projects that are literally in the period of transitioning this year. Um, I did provide the screenshot or sorry, the uh, one pagers uh, for both articles for modeling and HIOMAS. I'll first start with HIOMAS. Uh, and just give you a quick rundown on that. Um, the, uh, this project is really intended, the high resolution ice, ice ocean modeling system and simulation system, HIMS, is, is intended to simulate and predict sea ice and currents in the Arctic Ocean. The system is calibrated and validated using a, uh, using a range of available sea ice and ocean observations. Once validated, the system is used for near real-time hind casting and daily the seasonal forecasting of the Arctic Ocean currents, sea ice, and other environmental changes. Uh, this uh, research pays particular attention to uh, number one, the prediction of spatial distribution of ice ocean uh, ice motion and thickness. Number two, the fraction of thick ridged or multi-year ice, and three, the retreat and advance of ice edges. Um, this, uh, from the U.S. Coast Guard advantage, is the the sea ice factor that are most relevant to Arctic operations. And this is article for operations on the water, specifically with uh, the business of ice breaking. Uh, from the Coast Guard vantage point, accurate high resolution prediction of ocean and currents and sea ice conditions enhances Coast Guard's ability to prepare and respond to oil spills in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, this data, of course, uh, improves uh, Coast Guard safety mission sets and when conducting search and rescue. And has actually been utilized to help queue search and rescue operations uh, not to the Coast Guard, but actually in practice uh, to the North Slope Arctic Borough Search and Rescue folks uh, in the summer of 2017. Just one example of that. Um, the, uh, the one inherent strength for high mass is the ability to, uh, to generate high precision models of sea ice thickness, the movement of ice, and ocean currents across the Arctic Ocean. Uh, when we focus high mass in a particular region of concern, a uh, high mass is able to achieve even greater data precision if you will, um, high precision data. Uh, now, through our work, we're in the business of, of actually, this is again, a very mature uh, process uh, and sort of a very mature research product. Uh, we're currently at this point where we've successfully accomplished both six, four, and two kilometer resolution Pan-Arctic of ocean ice uh, thickness, ocean, ocean currents, CIS thickness, movement, and ridging. Uh, we've also just recently developed a one kilometer version, res fine resolution, that's used in the U.S. extended economic zone, essentially the Bering, uh, the northern Bering, if you will, or the Chukchi and Beaufort regions. This region is actually pinned to that specific region, but can be unpinned and refocused elsewhere. At one kilometer resolution, you can actually see things such as the open leads in the, in the ice. And uh, again, it's really mathematically derived, essentially but taking uh, quite a bit of satellite data to help create that, but it is a mathematically derived uh, program. It is computationally intensive. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, the, where this is being operated right now at uh, the Applied Physics Laboratory University of Washington uh, is really Day to day, it's really tough to crank out two clump resolution based on uh, pan Arctic based on the resolution or based on the computational limitations of the applied physics laboratory computers. That being said, we're now in the business of transitioning high mass 
from uh, the Applied Physics Laboratory to Axiom Data Sciences here in Anchorage to be hosted and supported to the Alaskan Ocean Observation System. And intended for us is uh, making this available to through AOS, which is an, uh, a no affiliate uh, for providing this data to not only across the AOS network, but also to NOAA's Arctic Environmental Management Application, uh, or Arctic IRMA for short. This data course is also going to be accessible uh, to the, uh, the Alaska Marine Exchange and other ways uh, as we look through uh, as, as we continue to use this as a, an example of uh, of what we are looking to accomplish in support of the ARC operator with this program. Uh, HIOMAS not only supports uh, that aspect, but also as a factor in supporting, depending on how you wish to toggle it, uh, the data to our oil spill modeling. I'll briefly transition this discussion to, from HIOMAS to uh, articles for modeling, and then, then cue this back to Q&A, and then by the time I have remaining, I'll cover additional product uh, research for the center. But uh, for us, the Arctic oil spill modeling is an, excuse me. Um, the Arctic oil spill modeling for us is a project also was the initial a legacy project for the center. And this is actually one that's uh, been developed between University of Alaska Anchorage and uh, Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. Uh, AOSM, for us, unlike the previous discussion, which was uh, what I found, found insightful, and I'm quite familiar with actually from uh, some of our colleagues, uh, including uh, the distinguished Dr. Ohio Eichen and his team at IARC, uh, as, uh, as they've done quite a bit of great work uh, in uh, characterizing oil movement through ice. Article is modeling is trying to characterize oil that is in a larger scale from the seafloor uh, to the surface and trying to account for under ice storage, not the transmission of oil specifically through the ice, but how much does a large oil spill pool based on the different characterizations of the under ice storage capacity of sea ice based on new, uh, new anywhere between new sea ice and multi-year sea ice. And of course, that under storage capacity has been modeled and characterized uh, and quite a bit now is it being going through validation uh, at the sea, at both smooth and rough ice experimentation at uh, Houston, I'm sorry, at, uh, at Texas A&M University. So what we started with, uh, similar to HIOMAS, we started with emission needs, where obviously Coast Guard needed to, in the case of HIOMAS, understand the ocean current, thickness, movement, ridging, presence, et cetera, characterizations of sea ice and knowing it at finer and finer scale levels, when uh, in order to help the Coast Guard in their mission set on, on the, in the Arctic Ocean specifically, uh, we take a look at this case here of characterizing two different types of oil spills. One that is generated, for example, at, uh, as a uh, Chuck Chi example from several years ago where you have uh, wells on the bottom of the ocean that would uh, fail um, in the Condo Canyon type scenario and then characterize the plume uh, based on the characteristics of uh, Chukchi and Boca Sea uh, oil and characterize that as it moves through the water column and calculating that through uh, a, an article spill calculator that the, the teams have put together characterizing both the plume and then how much oil is stored underneath the sea ice. And in this case here, um, then you take a look and you calculate over specific given areas and you apply to this not only, uh, and you can, again, you can apply based on the, the data input you choose for sea ice. In this case here, we can use articles for the long, can use the high mass project, or it can use other NOAA sea ice uh, prediction tools. Um, and in this case here, we actually can, you know, the research team can toggle uh, between the two uh, or between multiple characters of, of how to of getting that uh, sea ice data input. IMS just being one option. The intentions of this uh, project, though, is to, is to get sea ice, I'm sorry, is to get Arctic Ocean modeling into the NOAA, general NOAA operating modeling environment, NOAA. And in this case here, we are actually in transition of having completed the model development, specifically Arctic Ocean calculations and the overall Arctic Ocean modeling. 
And we've actually then done, gone over the course of the last year and a half or so, quite a bit of model validation uh, to include, of course, real recent uh, uh, work in both smooth ice, which has been concluded, and rough ice, uh, and again, the article, uh, how, the, how the oil will pool under that uh, Arctic ice. Um, we will finish that, the rough ice portion of this, this by this November timeframe. But then code this into both Pinome and Gnome uh, and JavaScript and other, uh, and other, computer, uh, other computer code um, injects to then be accessible to NOAA operators in Gnome, uh, modelers in Gnome uh, in response to unified command of an ARC oil spill. Uh, Mr. Chris Barker has been a great uh, collaborator and really been our uh, go-to source for making sure we get this right. The intentions are this, is that uh, we, we look at uh, NOAA's leading oil spill models provide expert advice to assist in incorporating the CI status test into GNOME. Uh, this research has provided a GNOME compatible model that forecasts movement of surface and under ice releases of oil and also gas. And many people recognize that, uh, for example, Chukchi and Beaufort Sea uh, oil is very gassy. Uh, this model takes uh, the, the article's model does take into account the under ice roughness that affects oil, specifically looking to that first 24 to 48 hours in oil spill. Uh, the article, so calculated, I mentioned earlier serves as an in-house platform and has been the great to guide for the development testing of the oil spill algorithms that's come from this. And uh, these algorithms are in the process of being incorporated to GNOME and actually are actually operational in GNOME to a certain degree already. Of course, this year between now and the 30th of June, we'll finalize that work. Um, the uh, oil fate uh, process subsurface transport uh, has included the work of the Texas A&M oil spill calculator at Tama. Uh, that model, of course, had been updated for an Arctic set of conditions originally de developed for the Gulf of Mexico, and has taken a look at the fate processes, notably the solution of oil and the subsurface transport uh, from a pipeline leak or well blowout from the bottom of the seabed. As I mentioned though earlier, uh, that just from an oil bed up is just one way we characterize uh, in article oil spill. The second one, of course, is characterizing from a vessel uh, that would be uh, leaking, it would strike ice or whatnot if you had such an instance. It's not just heavy crude, but it's also, you know, a kerosene variants of refined product that uh, characterizing that movement and spread in, a, in an ice laden water or sea, a sea ice bracketed with the open water sort of set of conditions. Um, and then, of course, this helps uh, to bear to characterize what could be the more practical near term because there's not o o deep uh, ocean water, no open ocean uh, drilling at this point in the Chukchi or Beaufort. But nonetheless, there is a movement of crude products literally today across the, uh, across the Chukchi and Be Beaufort going from uh, lower 48 or western uh, west coast into the, the ter Northwest Territories and some of the villages there and they're supplied by fuel, uh, fuel oil whatnot. So things such as that provide not only uh, a drilling opportunity uh, to understand, but also uh, that's being transported across the space, across the ocean spaces there. Um, so for us, the, the main point in uh, Arctic oil spill modeling is, is, is the process of transitioning uh, to known, and it is in the business of actually now being characterized, uh, of the, if you were doing the validation of the, of, the, of the model development to characterize from the seabed to the surface underneath the ice storage capacity of you know, of different characters of, characteristics of sea ice, again, from new ice to uh, multi-year ice. And that's, if you will, and if by the end of this year, that will transition uh, to the, the general NOAA operation modeling environment. Meanwhile, biomass is going to transition by the end of this year to AOS uh, via Axiom Data Sciences that does have the computation ability to handle that mathematically intense program to then publish via Arctic IRMA and other uh, NOAA affiliate uh, information and be accessible to, uh, to programs that just seek the HIMS inject, such as Arctic Oil Spill Modeling. HIMS has also uh, been utilized to help 
the Arctic oil spill modeling team uh, provide three-dimensional um, oil development in an isolated water uh, to our long-range autonomous underwater vehicle, or LRAV, which is a, essentially an underwater vehicle, autonomous underwater vehicle that characterize oil spills about 600 miles, 600, excuse me, 600 kilometers from point of entry in the water traveling under the ice and doing that three-dimensionally. And literally this week, I'll be flying down to uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute to do the uh, LRAVs, uh, first open water testing, characterizing a simulated uh, oil spill using sea dye there in, in the Monterey Bay area. Again, just one of our projects here at the center. So at this point, when I characterize uh, ADAC, I will share with you that specifically we do, do science technology research development in support of the Arctic operator. Uh, that being principally the U.S. Coast Guard. Biomass and Arctic oil spill modeling are two new projects that we're excited, uh, sorry, two legacy projects that we're excited to transition to, uh, to including state. And uh, again, our center is a research network that involves um, not only the University of Alaska, both in Anchorage and Fairbanks, but a research network across the U.S. with great research collaboration in Canada. Now, those products, of course, the other, you know, the second leg in the stool and the third leg in the stool is actually a very active fellows program at both the undergraduate and graduate level. And those student programs really capture, if you will, the next generation of Arctic researchers in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics region. So let me bring you to a close with that and see if there are any questions, and we'll take it from there. Thank you, Church. Yes, we have some time for questions, please. Anyone with questions? I have a quick question for you, Church. Um, it's really great to see the research transitioning into um, products that are, I think, going to make it much more available to a broader community. Was that always part of the plan for ADAC projects to generate products that become more accessible to a broader community of stakeholders and researchers? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for that question. Uh, the Arctic Man Center's Center's uh, principal focus of measure of merit is the ability to, to conduct uh, both fundamental and applied research and, and where appropriate, where applicable, transitioning that, pro, that research into a state where the customers can, can leverage and access the conducted research. So for us, transition of research to something that the users, specific Arctic operators can leverage is critically important to us. Now, the one thing I'll share is that in the case of the U.S. Coast Guard, they do not operate environmental models. And quite a bit of our work has been involved in environmentally focused models. So in this case here, the center actually has been uh, not only supports the U.S. Coast Guard, but if you think about it in a unified command uh, response of an Arctic oil spill model, that U.S. Coast Guard would be leading a composite team that would include quite a few folks from NOAA. And so as a result, some of our work transitions to NOAA uh, as simply the customer in this case as they in turn support the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, in the case, for example, of Hyomass, not only we're looking for Hyomass to support uh, a NOAA affiliate, but it also is in process of being model data can actually be published by you, the, the, the U.S. National Ice Center, the U.S. NIC. And in this case here, we have another project that's going to be directly operated by the U.S. NIC, and this is an ice conditions index for the Great Lakes region, essentially a mariner tool for Great Lakes operators that U.S. NIC will actually operate because while they're obviously not U.S. Coast Guard, they support the U.S. Coast Guard, and uh, this is a U.S. Coast Guard mission that U.S. NIC can actually produce to the benefit of the U.S. Coast Guard. We're actually in the context of developing a Arctic ice con that builds from the success of this completed, concluding uh, research for a Great Lakes Ice Condition Index and making this available for the Chukchi, uh, essentially the Northern Bering, Chukchi, and Beaufort Seas. And that's a project that's just getting underway for our center, but the building from the, the Great Lakes Ice Con. So again, the answer is our goal is to transition research that operators can operate it. And if it's just not quite there, then of course, contributing the body knowledge uh, that and some of our prior work 
actually can advance this for, but we really did not transition to a destination. Uh, one that uh, right now, our, our propeller-driven long-range autonomous water vehicle will actually transition to being a capability U.S. Coast Guard can leverage an ARC oil spill, but Coast Guard themselves are not quite skilled at operating technical vehicles such as LRAV. Uh, perhaps for the, uh, uh, in, a, in a near-term context, we'll continue to advance this in retainer to its U.S. Coast Guard, but operated at, uh, at HUI as they provide missions, uh, research support to U.S. Coast Guard mission needs. Back to you. Thanks, Church. Are there any other questions for either Church or Mark? You can feel free to type them in the chat box too if you aren't able to use your mic. All right, I'll open it up again one more quick time to see if anyone has any last minute updates that they want to share with the group. Olivia, I'll just have one, one further remark here, if I could. Of course. Um, first of all, for those who are interested, um, the current research projects that we have, obviously in addition to uh, high mass and ARC oil modeling, is that we're currently underway in developing a CS weather forecasting tool to improve situational awareness and crisis response in the Arctic. This is one that's being conducted principally at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Well, I mentioned earlier about the ice condition index for the Great Lakes region. This is a jointly shared project between UAA and UAF. We have another project in concluding right now. This is using vessel tracking data to prioritize bathymetric surveying in a rapidly changing Arctic. And this is actually being conducted at the Alaskan Ocean Observation System and uh, with support from the Alaska Sea Life Center. We're just getting a new project started at the, called the Arctic All Hazards GIS platform. And this is actually being conducted at University of Maryland. And then uh, an additional one for us is an Arctic vessel monitoring geofencing alerts and alert awareness. And this is a project that's actually being conducted at University of Alaska Anchorage and the Marine Prevention Response Network in Juneau, Alaska, along with the Marine Exchange, the Alaska Marine Exchange also in Juneau. We literally have four new projects until I get them actually developed. Uh, we'll not announce who those are. But uh, those four new projects are focused on Arctic oil spill modeling. And you'll be seeing announcements coming out here uh, later today. I have a couple of emails to follow up, and then we'll be doing the announcements on a broad scale later today. If there's anyone that would like to uh, know more about the center, uh, you're welcome to send me an email at rakee at alaska.edu. One way we try to make the projects aware uh, at, a, at a very usable level is that all of our projects are usually involved, well, all of them are, not just usually, but fully. Uh, we create project videos uh, that actually describe in about a four minute time span, uh, the big idea and a little bit of the research methodology. And we do this as a way because to help our Coast Guard and other customers uh, if you will better understand this project and that particular project and the details necessary for their understanding and awareness. Um, you're welcome to look us up at, uh, at, at uh, online. All you gotta do is talk, type in ADAC at University of Alaska or ADAC at UAA and you can, you'll, you'll direct you right to that spot and you're into our center. And again, if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to take them electronically uh, as you wish to offer, offer them up. Thank you so much, Church. And Mark, thank you for your time to present today. And thanks all for joining us. Uh, we've reached the top of our hour. And